and Tucci, and I'm a consultant to Riverscape. Uh, I just want to thank you for taking um, your lunch hour to being here this afternoon. Can I get a quick raise of hands? How many people have been over to the Waterways exhibit somewhat across the street? Whoop. Okay, so we just have a couple to have in. I'll forgive you. You have about two weeks left. And I know that a lot of you have family and friends coming into town for the holiday, so it's the perfect time to bring your family and friends to it because we have a lot of kid-friendly things for them to do. The library, don't thank you. They've donated a lot of kid books. There's a stream table from ISU from their um, environmental science program, and the kids love it. So it's not just for adults. So make sure you get your kids and your grandkids on over there or go back on over there again. Um, I did want to mention that uh, Riverscape has been focused on the beautification and redevelopment of the Wabash River Corridor in Vigo County. Uh, Riverscape is pleased to bring waterways to West Terre Haute, one of six small towns in Indiana selected to host the exhibit. And we're also responsible for, for producing a speaker series and a companion exhibit, which you'll see or you have already seen when you visited um, the Smithsonian portion. And how many of you have been to these talks already? I'm assuming like a lot of people. So I won't go through a lot of the history of all that stuff again. Um, but I do want to thank Dan Clark for being here today. He is an associate professor of history at Indiana State University. He's the author of uh, Creating the College Man and the upcoming release of A History of Indiana State University from Normal School to Teachers College, 1865 to 1933. When I interviewed Dan to do the preview talk to help promote to get y'all here, I think I said, I'll, be, I'll just be in your office for about 20 minutes. Oh, an hour, 20 minutes later. I had so much fun talking to Dan um, that I'm really looking forward to his talk here this afternoon. And I'd recommend picking up one of his books, too. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> right in time for Christmas season. Yes. Without further ado, Dan Clark. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here this afternoon. I've not been in this facility, and it's quite nice. And it's great to see a nice turnout over lunch. Uh, the lunch period, I really appreciate it. See some, see some old friends in, in, the, in the audience, Charlie and Donna and, and, uh, and Deed back there. But I uh, look forward to meeting some of you later and get a little bit uh, more information on that. This has been a nice little break for me. Um, as you know, the semester just wound up at Indiana State and I found myself frantically grading toward the last minute. I, for some reason, had put things off a little bit more than I normally do. And uh, right up to noon on Tuesday, I was still entering things in and uh, into the system. Uh, but I got it done and then, you know, had to switch gears and, and think more about this. I'd been thinking about it and reading about it for a while. Um, Dr. Uh, President Bradley uh, contacted me, oh, months ago about doing this. And you don't say no to President Bradley <laughs> when he asks you to do something. And I was happy to do it. Um, as I told Jane, and I'll bring it up a little bit later, uh, you know, this is not river history or even Native American history, which it touches on it, but Terre Haute history is not really my wheelhouse. I, I was trained as an intellectual, American intellectual historian. So and I ended up specializing on, on higher ed and, and uh, the history of higher ed. And that's where I, I've gotten into writing, uh, the, uh, invited to write the, the new history of Indiana State. And that's really where my head's been the last several years. And again, as Jane mentioned, that, that the first volume of that will come out this, uh, this spring. But I'm still working on the second volume, of course. Um, but this is a nice break. And I discovered, um, of course, when you write the history of Indiana State, it's intimately intertwined with the history of Terre Haute. Uh, so I, you know, of necessity, had to read more about that. But I'm a historian that, that loves history. That's, you know, kind of, kind of goes without saying. But I'm very curious about it, almost every kind of history. And so when, when President Bradley asked me to do this, um, I hesitated for a second, but as again, I, you don't say no to President Bradley. And then uh, it's really been an interesting uh, trip to, to go down and, and uh, read other people's histories and collect that and throw it together for, for all of you and to present it and to get my head around it. So it's been a lot of fun. And so again, I, I really appreciate you taking your time to get out here this afternoon, um, this morning, this afternoon, and, and, uh, and have a little interesting talk about uh, where the river intersects with the history of Terre Haute. And it's mainly going to focus on the, the founding of Terre Haute and then the early development of Terre Haute. Um, again, I, I'm not a historian of the river or the environment. There's a lot of questions came up to, that I had that I maybe some of you can help me answer 
um, particularly about waste removal. And I'll get to that in a bit because that, this one the, I took a history class on urban history and, and there was an interesting observation about where you get your water and where you put your water. And, you know, uh, so we'll, we'll, that'll come up later. But maybe some of you know a little bit more about that than I do. Um, when I was doing the background on this, uh, you, know, uh, on, you know, why did Terre Haute develop as an area as a, and eventually a town? Um, I ran across Mike McCormick, who many of you probably know, of course, his uh, book on Terre Haute. And I don't know where exactly he got this, but I liked his idea of saying, you know, Terre Haute was a location and then a place in the early history of it. Many of you know, of course, Terre Haute means high ground, the heights of the Wabash, and it was referring mainly to the bluffs on the eastern bank uh, and, and the western bank that, the, that were the first high ground really on, 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 the, on the Wabash River. And I don't know, some of you might know more on this, you know, somebody told me a long time ago that there you know, it was part of a terminal moraine from the glacier period that probably pushed this area and, and helped create the bluffs from here on north. Uh, again, I'm, that's not, that's again out of my wheelhouse, so I'm not too sure about that. But um, that's the reason for this locale being important and special as kind of a, a you know, a place particularly for Native American trade and travel. As many of you know, Native American groups um, love to settle on river systems. Um, and, you know, this area was very attractive. It had dry prairies. It had wetlands but it had wooded areas, and there had always been uh, Native American villages in the area, here on the Vermilion River, on the other creeks. Usually they settled around uh, on the edge of a dry prairie, close to woods where they could uh, forage and, and, and hunt, but also, and not too close to the water for obvious reasons, a flood could happen. Uh, so, I mean, there were signs of, of these kinds of villages on different parts around Terre Haute, particularly on the east bank. Um, and there's been some archaeological evidence of that, dating all the way back to the uh, you know, 1000 BC, all the way up into the 900, uh, I still say AD, I'm sorry, it's a common error, I guess, is the thing, but um, a historian, I should be more politically correct on that. But, uh, um, and you know, again, I'm not an expert on the ar archaeological background, but there, are, there is evidence, of course, of some mounds in the area. I was kind of shocked to to hear about that around Prairie Creek and Marome. Of course, that's not Terre Haute area, but it's, it, you know, a lot of mounds eventually were, were um, if they did exist, were uh, plowed under or, or used for fill. Uh, so there might have been even more mounds. I ran across an interesting speculation from the Chronicles of Hernando de Soto, where he referred to an Indian kingdom roughly in this area. And uh, there was an archeological dig in 1949 around the prison or the penitentiary that turned up some Spanish trade beads, some other things that should not be there. So again, there's always been this kind of speculation that um, there maybe was even more Native American uh, civilization around here than one might expect. The first Europeans, though, were French fur traders, as many of you would imagine. They called this area the Illinois country. and. and um, I've got this map of the river systems. I'm sorry I can't expand it too much, but you can see the Wabash outline. The Illinois country for the French was the Mississippi on, on the west, the Illinois River, then the Wabash River that went into the interior, and the Ohio River on the south. And that was really a major trade area, again, particularly for fur, uh, some missionary activity. Of course, the French wanted to uh, convert as many Native Americans as possible. And you know some of your early uh, explorer history from when you were growing up, I assume. Most of the native speaking tribes, or most of the Native American tribes in the area spoke Algonquin. Uh, that is the Miami, the Potawatomi, the Wea, um, the Kickapoo. Some uh, other groups were displaced from the east, the Delaware and the Shawnee. And of course, Shawnee is gonna be very important when we talk about Tecumseh uh, just in just a bit, I'm, although I'm not gonna dive deeply into that. Um, the Maumee Wabash Corridor becomes a very important trade route, you know, this portage from the, the lake area up here down to the Wabash. Uh, it was a pretty short portage you know, to carry your canoe. And so this becomes a major trade artery for the French in the Illinois country. And Terre Haute became kind of the you know, unofficial boundary between two administrative colonial areas. To the south uh, was, of course, Louisiana. And eventually you get the town of New Orleans that is founded. And to the north, it was Quebec and the French speaking areas there. And Wiatnan, uh, Fort Wiatnan, which it gets, many of you know, is, gets founded around Lafayette, 
as one of the major French trading posts, that really was connected to the northern uh, administrative colonial area, whereas Vincennes, where it gets founded, Wiatnon actually predates Vincennes. Uh, Wiatnon is around 1719, Vincennes is 1733. There's a lot of correspondence that Terre Haute was kind of this, again, the heights, it, wasn't, it was just a place, right? It was a locale, uh, was a, a rendezvous point. There again, there would be Indian villages, Native American villages in the area, their traders would stop, and it would be a point of communication and supply linkages between these two French administrative areas, right? The, the Quebec uh, areas, French Canada, and the, Native, and the Louisiana areas. But it was part of this major river system. It's interesting, I grew up in Illinois, and you know, why was the Illinois River system not as, well, evidently the Fox Indians there were a little bit more uh, uh, cantankerous, I guess you could say. And, uh, and the, this was a lot more friendly area for the French than the Illinois River Valley was. But again, Terre Haute is, uh, is mentioned quite a bit in correspondence and references, this high ground uh, as a rendezvous point. Um, in the American Revolutionary era, again, for, for Terre Haute, not a lot happens. Of course, a lot happens a little further south in Vincennes, but we're not going to necessarily get into that. I was interested, though, because a, a lot of private land companies formed trying to uh, get land rights to the area around Terre Haute. For like 20 years, they fought with the, they, they, they lobbied with the British, they lobbied with the Americans to try to get some idea of, of uh, land claims and, and got nowhere. To the credit of the American government, you know, it's like, you, you have to, we have to negotiate with the Native Americans, uh, you know, for that. We're not going to have any claims. Now, it's one of the better times that the, the American government, the uh, United States government dealt with Native Americans in, the, in that regard. But land claims went nowhere. And there wasn't much settlement in the 1780s and 1790s. And part of the reason there um, had to do with, uh, you know, along the Ohio, uh, white American settlement was pushing down. But in 1791, right up in this area, uh, and it's called the Battle of the Wabash, uh, General uh, Arthur St. Clair was horribly defeated. Some of you might know this, this, uh, this history. Um, I ran across it again. Um, Oh, I, what was, I can't remember his author, the author, my brain's fried from finals, but uh, the, the author I read on, on this uh, uh, fantastic history on the Ohio Valley. And, um, you know, this, this battle, this loss was, you know, it's, it's three times as many uh, Americans died in that than the Battle of Little Bighorn, but you never hear of it. But this is really what inhibited a lot of white settlement into this area because of the, the severity of this loss uh, by uh, General Sinclair. Uh, you know, something like 600, uh, I've read as many as 900, uh, were killed, 200 and some wounded um, in this Battle of the Wabash. Again, you can look it up for yourself. Uh, the main chief of the Miami that uh, attacked them was Little Turtle. Uh, and again, it really inhibited settlement. Now, the revenge happened, uh, the, the, the United States government got its act together and sent Mad Anthony Wayne uh, against, and you get the Battle of Fallen Timbers. And again, where you get Fort Wayne up there. Um, and that settles some things for the time, particularly for the Ohio country, but for the Indiana area, and that's still part of the, called the Illinois Territory, um, it was still not very uh, settled as far as, uh, you know, feeling any kind of, uh, as far as white American settlement moving in there, you just didn't have very much. Uh, Vincennes is the only place, and we're, then we're only talking about maybe 80 families uh, that were in Vincennes, and most of those were a mixture of old French and, and Native American uh, groups in there. Going into the next era, which we I mean, might call the era of the War of 1812, that's really where Terre Haute becomes more than a place, and of course gets its history as with the fort, with Fort Harrison. Um, roughly around here was the infamous or famous 10 o'clock line, right? The 10 o'clock line, that was negotiated as kind of the, the northern boundary of white settlement uh, and of, of Native American settlement, uh, this conglomeration of tribes that Tecumseh, and I'll come show his image in just a second, had kind of uh, assembled in the northern part of, uh, of the Illinois country. And that was the, uh, again, kind of the scene as the northern boundary, but you really didn't have much settlement north of Vincennes um, during this time period. You know, Tecumseh had, uh, had uh, and his, his brother, I'll just, I'll go there, had, uh, had set up Prophetstown. This is Tecumseh and Tenskatawa. 
his brother. Um, and they were the ones that were really rallying a conglomeration of Native American tribes to stop white settlement. And of course, many of you know of the, the, the great battle that happens, the Battle of Tippecanoe uh, with William Henry Harrison there on the left. We'll come to Zachary Taylor in his younger years in just a second. Um, but the founding, uh, really, in, in a lot of ways, the founding of Terre Haute as more than a place is because of the Battle of Tippecanoe, as many of you know. When Harrison and Tecumseh have a meeting in uh, the summer of 1811, it doesn't go well. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, the accounts from a lot of people of Tecumseh, it, it really that he's you know, described as a splendid fellow. He's six foot tall, fine features, bold. Uh, he evidently almost gets in, into it with Harrison uh, during the negotiations. And he's bound and determined to stop, you know, to have this assemblage of, of tribes and stop white settlement. Harrison, to his, uh, to his respect and wisdom, figures, I'd rather not fight this guy when he's around. And as Tecumseh goes out to recruit more, Harrison plans to attack Prophetstown uh, while Tecumseh's gone. Many of you might know the history know this is about the same time as the great New Madrid uh, earthquake. Uh, Tecumseh uses this as a rallying point. And it's a good thing Harrison probably attacked when he did because Tecumseh had more, uh, because of that earthquake and, and what it portended, uh, probably was recruiting even more uh, at the time. But the reason Terre Haute becomes more than a place is because as Harrison moves north from Vincennes with his, uh, his force, uh, around 900 troops and their supporters, um, and there were always women and children in, in these military you know, vanguards, by the way. I just always like to add that. Um, but they built a fort, right? They built a fort. At, uh, at where the Elks, the old Elks Country Club uh, is now, Fort Harrison, 150 foot wide, roughly about 46 meters uh, complete, uh, uh, you know, it's its cir circumference area. Um, and I've got a, an image of that I'll show in just a second. Uh, but they built that on their way up to the battle. And again, I don't want to recount the battle because it doesn't really pertain necessarily to the history of Terre Haute, but it was that campaign and the founding of that fort as, as again, kind of a, a forward base camp, and then they left there to, as a forward defense of, of, of Vincennes, that why Terre Haute became more than a place, more than a rendezvous place, more than just a trade point with Native American villages that came and went in the area. Um, and the Battle of Tippecanoe, of course, is important for a lot of reasons. Uh, Tenskatawa, uh, the, the one-eyed prophet the, the, of Tecumseh, an interesting figure, right? Uh, he's defeated by Harrison uh, at the Battle of Tippecanoe, but they found British muskets on the ground that the British, of course, were feeding the Native American tribes. And this is part of what precipitates then the, the War of 1812 that starts in the next year. People, Americans were angered uh, by the British uh, encouragement of, of uh, Native American raiding parties. Uh, Tecumseh was, of course, the most dangerous uh, example of that. And you get the War of 1812 that starts. Now, many of you know the War of 1812 doesn't go well. I'll just go here. This is a picture of the fort, one of the earliest drawings of Fort Harrison. In the early stages for the, for the young United States, it's uh, defeat after defeat. One of the only victories, it gets celebrated, and again, we don't hear about this hardly at all anymore, but one of the early and only victories that gets celebrated across the, the young United States is the successful siege of Fort Harrison, the, the defeat of the siege. Now, a young Zachary Taylor, now this is the old rough and ready Zachary Taylor of later years. I don't know what he looked like when he was younger. Um, probably had a little bit more hair, but, uh, uh, but he was put in charge as a captain of Fort uh, Harrison. And Miami Indians uh, had, it came in, in scouting parties in, in, uh, in the summer and leading into September of 1812. Taylor only had 50 soldiers, but had an epidemic that was sweeping through and only had around 15 that were healthy. Native Americans, they knew this and were gonna take advantage of it. Um, about 600 Potomac, Potawatomi and Wea, uh, one of the chiefs name was Stone Eater, I love that name. Um, but they had hatched a plan, uh, again, had scouted out the fort, knew its weaknesses, evidently the cattle had kind of licked some of the Areas, so you had, you, you had uh, air in between, you had between some of the, the blockhouse logs that would make it burn easier. And one of the chiefs knew this, crawled up to the edge of the fort, set it on fire. He had, had, you know, had to spark it and had to wait for the guards to get. And it engulfs one of the blockhouses. 
Now, Taylor, when he talks about this later, his own report, now maybe he was embellishing, you know, that this really didn't look good. I mean, the blockhouse went up, the whiskey that was stored there, because you always had to have whiskey, right? It was part of the rations that Americans needed to have, uh, engulfs the blockhouse, uh, and, it, and things didn't look good. Roughly 600 warriors uh, come descend on it, and those that are left, including the women and civilians that were there, uh, had to get organized, and they get organized. It's one of those interesting, again, stories. If this had gone up, you know, maybe Terre Haute doesn't become the place that it does. Uh, but Zachary Taylor and the defenders held off for roughly uh, six hours, different assaults of the Native Americans. They actually threw up some breastworks on the interior, where there was, of course, with the fire, there was a, 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 a gap in the wall that you could storm. And they threw up breastworks. They organized bucket brigades to put out some of the other fires so the walls didn't catch. One of the women who was rather small was able to go down a well and get water to bring back up for the bucket brigade. So it was really uh, all hands on deck battle. And again, six hours. Now after that, the Native American settled in prestige and they drove off all the cattle uh, that could have been there. And two relief parties that came from Vincennes, both were ambushed and defeated. One was almost annihilated. Only two survived the first relief party. Um, it, they were attacked, by the way, in an area called the Narrows in southern Vigo County, close to where modern Fairbanks is today. The second relief party, they just left the stuff and, and ran off, and that's what saved their lives. But finally, uh, a small army of relief did arrive from Vincennes on September 12th, so a little bit over a week. And evidently, the garrison there, what was left, uh, were in pretty rough shape, uh, although a siege could have lasted a lot longer. They were lucky. As I said, too, it's interesting is that in the early part of the War of 1812, when there wasn't a lot of victories to celebrate, this became a major celebration across the country that they, they'd held off this attack. Um, doesn't seem like much to celebrate. And again, we don't hear about it much now, but the fort becomes an important place. And now it gets demilitarized in 1818. But it gets used as a prop in several political campaigns thereafter. William Henry Harrison, of course, Tippecanoe and Tyler, too. And then when Zachary Taylor runs for president, he, he uh, comes there and campaigns. So it becomes, again, an important stop uh, for political reasons. But Terre Haute obviously becomes more than a place with the fort there, something that feels a little bit more safe. And it starts to attack, attract speculators who are going to plan a town. And clearly, Terre Haute had you know, early villages. There were burial grounds that many of you know about, uh, settler cemeteries and, and Indian Native American burial grounds. Plus, there were a lot of fruit trees planted. And you know, those sometimes grow naturally, but more often are planted. So definitely, the Native American villages around Terre Haute definitely uh, were an attraction point. Now, how does Terre Haute become more than a place, become a town? Well, it is, again, still mainly about the river. Uh, early speculators and pioneers, uh, they're an interesting lot. Um, not all of them ended up settling here. Most everybody knows about Major Abraham Markle, uh, Markle's Mill. On the, on the, you know, it's interesting that most of the organizers of the Terre Haute Company didn't settle here, but where the, when they did settle, they, they were more interested in the creeks because that's where you could dam up the creeks and get your mill, and you knew you were going to make money if you had a mill, right? Uh, you know, selling plots of land in Terre Haute, that was just to attract trade, you know, Terre Haute was set up mainly as a port of entry, where you could get farmers, you know, get off the, the, the boats in, 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 in Terre Haute, and uh, that would be the point of entry, so you could settle in the creek beds and bottoms. And, and again, the, the real smart money in the early days like, was like Markle. You, you, you get a mill, and because everybody's got to, to grind their grain for, for food. But Markle was one of the first ones, and I didn't know the history of Markle a little bit. Maybe you don't either. Interesting character. He's born in upstate New York, but he moved to Ontario, and he gets elected to their parliament, but he becomes a Canadian revolutionary. He wants the United States to annex Canada, and he actually helps, and he's one of the officers in, a, in, a, in a, an outfit, a military outfit that helps fight against the Canadians in the, in the War of 1812. He's actually found guilty of treason in absentia, uh, and Mike McCormick in his book, and I'm not sure where he got it from, but it was really interesting. It's like, they're going to hang him, but not till he's dead, because then you have to cut him open and get his entrails out and, and draw and quarter, right? Uh, that was how you had to do that for the king, because he betrayed the king. Uh, 
Now, this is all in abstention. It sounds very colorful, but uh, it, you know, of course, never happened. But others were, the other people in this Terre Haute company that formed to plat out the, the town were equally interesting. There was a, a North Carolina Quaker who didn't like slavery and brought many of his uh, family and acquaintances north to the area. I was reminded a lot of some of your uh, ancestors, D, on that, but th these were mainly uh, white settlers, but uh, in that regard. And then uh, again, uh, other colorful groups that, uh, or people that were involved, again, most of them ended up not staying here. But they platted, uh, they bought 900 acres out of the, for, out of the Vincennes uh, territorial office in 1816, laid out, I don't know if I've got, uh, oh, this is a, a depiction of, the, of Captain uh, Zachary Taylor directing the siege of, uh, of, of Fort Harrison. I should have shown that earlier, I'm sorry. This is one of the earliest plats of Terre Haute, and I wish you could see it more. Um, this is Water Street right on the river, then First and Second, and then Market. Third Street was gonna be Mar Market Street, and it was designed to be wider because that's where the farmers and, and would come in and display their wares on market day. Uh, but you can see it, it, was, it snug very close to the river. And uh, there, were, there were larger lots on either end where we're going to see industry uh, is going to take off. Um, but that was what they platted. The north boundary was Chestnut. Um, the south boundary was Swan. Uh, the eastern boundary was Fifth Street. And then of course, Water Street uh, to the west. Uh, but as I said, Terre Haute becomes this port of entry and of course for commerce uh, with the settling farmers that was spread into the interior. One of the first farmers that actually ends up in, in the Riley Township is a Joseph Lister, Liston, by the way, is often seen as the first white farmer uh, in the Terre Haute area. But there are a lot of interesting and familiar names when you start looking at the, at the history. Dr. Charles Modisette was the first physician in the area. Uh, actually knew how to clear the courthouse square from trees. If you ever know how they do that, they actually gird the trees, you know, to, to kind of strangle them, and then they're easier to get out, but it can't have looked very nice for several years. But, uh, you know, that's what you had to do when you first started clearing an area, uh, as Terre Haute was, was doing then. Um, another, uh, and he didn't stay long either, a William Bratton and his brother. Now, his brother stayed, but William Bratton was on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, and again, it was uh, fascinating to, uh, to know that you had some of these uh, folks that had their own personal histories that were quite colorful. In an early inn, and I'm not sure where it was, I think it was on Water Street, but I'm not sure, I think Water in Ohio, perhaps. Uh, I'd love to see an image of this. It was called uh, the Eagle and Lion. And the image on the Eagle and Lion was of an eagle plucking out the eye of the British lion. So again, it was kind of an anti-British uh, image and uh, again, um, uh, one of the more colorful of the, of the local inns that were there. So from here, how does the Wabash River uh, contribute to Terre Haute becoming uh, first a town and then a, a pretty major city? And again, it, it had to do with that river traffic, that conduit. And the main, the main con contribution, and this is a, a later uh, image, and it really had, expanded a whole lot beyond uh, tent streets where the railroads come in. And again, you can see, still see that this, this dates from the 18, uh, later on in the 1850s. But steamboat traffic and uh, keelboats and flatboats, and I'll show images of that, that's really the lifeblood of Terre Haute. Uh, you know, the, the settlers would come in, but it, they would be able to uh, uh, sell their produce, uh, you know, corn and, and, and hogs primarily back. Um, and so the early, I'll, I'll talk more about the steamboats in a second, the early industries that get founded are, you know, the, the way you ship grain is, you know, you refine it into liquor, right? Uh, and Terre Haute, as many of you know, becomes a major distillery uh, capital, really, of the, of the Midwest. Um, and, and again, that was the easiest way to turn your corn into something marketable, what you don't consume and what you don't feed your hogs you know, what's left over, uh, you sell. And of course you needed the keel boats uh, and, and steamboats to ship your grain sometimes to places like Terre Haute where it gets distilled. The other big industry was pork slaughterhouses, hogs, right? That was the main, you know, you fed your corn to have hogs, you have excess hogs, you get rid of them. And, uh, and you, you, you know, have pork, you were showing how many there were. 
Yeah, at, at one, eventually there are tons. Uh, there are, you know, I had six, but you know, again, you, at, at, when you get into the 1850s, there, there are eight, but those were the early major industries. You can see that they were complementary to the kind of agricultural uh, life that was crowded around. And again, the river traffic was key to that. After you slaughter the hogs, it was the steamboats that carried that produce away, or the keel boats. Uh, same with the um, same with the the slot, you know, that, the, the, with the distilleries. There also was a major cooperage industry that tr tr that, that grew up barrel making, right? Uh, that was the containers then that would be able to ship ship the, uh, the the pork or the distilled liquor or the beer, which was another, of course, major industry. Um, and all of this depended on river traffic and, of course, water. And this is where I get into the first mention of waste because. Uh, pork products, you had a lot of waste, and it had to go somewhere, and most of it got dumped into the river. And that's going to be the beginning of a long tradition of industry using the river. And again, we're not unique. This is why river towns like Pittsburgh and other places take off. It was a very convenient dump. And, uh, you know, and that was the, the reason that you had uh, a lot of the industries along the rivers in these early periods. Um, so. Terre Haute starts to really grow. We're, we're still only talking about, you know, 13, 14,000 people, maybe by the time you get to the Civil War. Uh, again, clinging very close to the river. Um, but it, it really has taken off it, mainly in the 1830s and 1840s through the river traffic, the distilleries, the pork slaughterhouses. Um, and again, that was what set Terre Haute up for its growth. Becomes officially a town. In 1838, the Indiana legislature granted a charter to have a mayor and 10 councilmen. Uh, so that's when you start to have the, the city divided up into wards. Um, I don't think I have any pictures. These are just, these are the other major river traffic. These are the, this is what a flat boat looks like. Um, and again, flat boats and keel boats. Now keel boats sometimes could have a, a, a sail. Uh, but mainly it was, it was propelled by either poles or oars, same as a flat boat. Uh, so you can imagine they don't do very well going upstream. Uh, it's mainly for going downstream. But that was the other major uh, uh, sh kind of boat besides the steamboats. And I'll come back to the steamboats. Um, as many of you know, the Wabash is only navigable about eight or nine months of the year. And going back to the steamboats, you know, 1830s, you had over 200 steamboats a year dock in Terre Haute. So I, I should have put, told you that number earlier. But we're talking about, and of course you'd have hundreds of more uh, keel boats and flat boats, but we're talking about major river traffic. Again, when you have 200 steamboats a year in the 1830s. But still, with only being navigable eight to nine months out of the year, and many of you have heard talks on the canals before, so I'm not going to go much into it, but you know, the canals were the first way we can use the river and the river systems, but through canals have more navigability throughout more, and Terre Haute was going to be the main headquarters on the lower part of the Wabash and Erie Canal. Starts in the 1830s in Fort Wayne, eventually goes to Toledo in, the 18, in 1843, reaches Lafayette in 1841, gets down to Terre Haute um, in 1849. But the way I, and I, I'm not going to go into any detail on the canals, the interesting thing to me, and I discovered this when I was doing the Indiana State History, is that it, as many of you know, it financially ruined the state of Indiana. It was a horrible investment. Um, it just did not go well. You know, the Erie Canal in New York was financially incredibly successful, and that's what really drew a lot of, uh, a lot of attraction to the Wabash and Erie Canal. It's a fantastic system. It's a wonderful history. It just didn't make any money. And, you know, it, it causes, in some of the smaller towns, like in the northern part of the state, it, it did, uh, you know, seed some business and some traffic. Um, but again, it, it ruins, almost ruins the financial stability of Indiana. And this is where I first ran across this because it was right about the time they wanted to found a normal school and, uh, and, 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 and found a free public education. And it, Hoosiers had soured so much on these grand schemes that required their taxes that they didn't want much to do with free public education and free normal schools. Uh, I'm going to say free, but tuition free normal schools. So it, it puts back uh, the, you know, the, this is where the canals intersect with a lot of other things because the, the problems of that really puts back uh, the cause of education in Indiana and causes Caleb Mills, of course, to have his great uh, uh, 
papers on how backward Indiana was that shames Hoosiers into finally doing something about it in the late 1850s. But I digress. It's one of my more favorite topics, talking about <laughs> education history and Indiana history. So the river was still key to the prosperity of Terre Haute going into the 1850s and post-Civil War period. And this is where I had six pork packing plants on my, but, but I, I believe you, it's probably more like a seven or eight. Uh, in the 1850s, over, over 100,000 hogs would be processed a year at these slaughterhouses. And of course, it was steamboats and flatboats that carried the produce away. Um, also, you know, the, the, the steamboat era really peaked in the 1850s. And you can see, we're not talking about the grand steamboats like you can take river cruises on today, of course. And it's not like the, some of the huge ones you saw at the Mississippi. They were a little bit more modest. Um, but I ran across an interesting, this, um, the floating palace. So even entertainment got uh, put on the river in the 1850s. This was a this was a it was called the Spalding and Rogers Circus, and they put together a floating palace out of Cincinnati that was built in Cincinnati, um, and they it came to Terre Haute. It must have been some high water, but it got to Terre Haute in 1853. It mainly plied the Ohio and the Mississippi. Um, 200 foot long, 60 foot wide. It had a, a full ring you know circus in the middle, over 3,400 seats, a thousand on the on the lower end, 1,500 in what they call the family section. I don't know if that's you know the cheaper seats where the kids are. And they also, because of course it was segregated in the time period, they had 900 seats for African Americans because it was segregated. But that was the time. But um, at least they had seats, I guess. Uh, but you know the, the you know the idea was that you're going to bring you're going to bring entertainment to where the people were on a grand scale. Um, it had 200 gas lights, so it was gas fed to light it. And I don't hear any stories of it catching fire, which is remarkable. Um, but again, it was this grand uh, palace uh, for entertainment and again for the circus and mainly equestrian shows that came there uh, and again came to Terre Haute in 1853. Post Civil War is when Terre Haute starts to take off. Um, getting into the, and one of the signs of that is the building of a new bridge in 1865. This is the wagon and uh, uh, the wagon bridge, so-called, uh, that was mainly a toll bridge for quite some time. Uh, but it was, this, it was mainly a, a pedestrian and, uh, and, and wagon bridge. Uh, railroads, when they came, uh, would build other bridges to the north, um, which we can talk about. But it's, it's a post-1865 post period where industry really takes off. And it was interesting because it was steamboats, I read, that brought the first railroad supplies to Terre Haute. So the first steam engines were brought by steamboat. All the rail lines, all the iron and steel rail lines were brought by steamboats. So steamboats really seeded their own destruction as far as uh, uh, you know, a, a commercial industry uh, because, of course, it's going to be the railroads that are going to carry the bulk of industrial traffic as Terre Haute starts to grow. But I did run across, I don't know if I have a... I think I have an image of it. And this is a classic picture of Terre Haute in 1880, where it's expanded quite a bit. Um, Hudnut, American hominy. Uh, again, there are many different uh, industrial places that take off in the late 19th century, the iron works, the nail works. But uh, I ran across, Hud I'm not sure exactly what they used it for, but Hudnut, you know, he's, he's known as the America's uh, corn king, hominy king, but he had his own little miniature fleet of steamboats where again, he picked up, uh, I would imagine, bulk grain supplies along the river uh, and uh, also use it for delivery. Um, but he would also rent them out, I found out later too. But again, he had his own line of steamboats well into the late 19th century. Um, I'm sure that eventually they get replaced by, by the railroads. River commerce, though, starts to decline. And I don't know exactly you know, when are some of the last uh, you know, examples, but uh, you know, major commerce on the river really de declines after the 1880s when, when so many railroads start to come through Terre Haute. But there is some twilight industries, I guess we could say, that, that make, uh, make a showing on the river. And one of the first ones is mussel shells uh, that were made into buttons. Now, um, many of you, you know, evidently the quality of the mussels in the, in the Wabash Valley, the Wabash River Valley, and some of the other river valleys in the area are very good. And they became very sought after. And, and you know, many towns up and down the Wabash, including Terre Haute, had uh, you know, 
basically wholesalers or people that would collect these mussel shells. Kids would go out and collect them and sell them by the bucket. You also, though, had, you had steamship, steamboats that would ply up and down and collect them and commercial fishermen. But you know, New York uh, ready-to-wear garment manufacturers would come, and Paris would come to, uh, yeah, they had buyers that would come to Terre Haute and Vincennes and other places to buy mussel shells in bulk. And, and many of the cities had basically button factories that would make the buttons. And here are some, some examples you can see of, of how they were made. But you know, ready-to-wear clothing, you don't think how much that revolutionizes uh, industry. And it, it starts, I always tell my students, you know, you, you got the, the Union Army to thank for that because you know, most people had their clothes made for them by their families prior to the Civil War, but you had to outfit the Union Army so quickly that it invents the ready-to-wear industry. Every time you get a pair of shoes and the different sizes, that comes from the Union Army. You know, small, medium, and large. You know, that's basically your generic sizes that come from the Union Army. And then after the war, all these ready-to-wear places in the North are looking for markets to get rid of their cheap clothes. And it invents the ready-to-wear industry that needs all these buttons. And so it creates this incredible button industry that takes off. Uh, right here in, Indus in, in Terre Haute, you had Kuppenheimer, uh, which was a major uh, uh, shirt, manu uh, shirt manu they made other things, but uh, I ran across their advertisements when I was doing my, my first book, uh, which mainly the source material was in magazines. And, uh, and, and advertisements were a big part of what I was looking at. And Kuppenheimer here in Terre Haute was a major uh, shirt manufacturer. And again, so I'm sure they bought a lot of buttons uh, from, from the river. Another industry, I don't have any images for it, uh, that for time was quite good, was the Johnson Brothers Motor Company. Uh, they were uh, maritime engine makers uh, for, for small, small boats. Um, and they made their name racing on the Wabash. So again, you, you, we know that uh, there were boat races on the Wabash, uh, competitive boat races, and the Johnson brothers won quite a few, and their uh, company expands. Eventually, they get into monoplanes, uh, engines, again, you know, where you need a light, a light engine. Um, unfortunately, they get wiped out in that infamous tornado of 1913, uh, that, and then the flood that follows that devastates even more, particularly in West Terre Haute. Uh, but this, this tornado evidently was, was horrible. It, it wiped out the root glass company on the south side of town, the Gartland Foundry, and took out the Johnson Brothers factory as well. As some they described as like 500 yards wide, this tornado that comes through uh, in the time period. The last uh, point that I'll mention as far as kind of subsidiary or twilight commerce on the, on the, uh, on the Wabash, I ran across when I was doing my research on Indiana State. And that, why wow, I wish they would have this now, pleasure cruises on the Wabash. Um, these weren't steamboats by this time. They were motorized. But they were rather large boats, and, and uh, I found that sororities particularly, there were more sororities and fraternities because there were more women at Indiana State Teachers College uh, in the 1920s and 30s. They, in the summer, they would rent these excursion boats for parties. They would cruise up the Wabash uh, for a couple hours and come back. They'd be about a four hour, and they would have bands that would perform. Uh, the Gaiety Orchestra was one name. The Jazz Pirates were another. I, that was my particular favorite, the Jazz Pirates. Um, but again, they would have these four-hour cruises. They would have dances on these cruises uh, up the Wabash and back, and multiple during the summer. I mean, pre there, were, there were roughly, I don't know, eight or nine sororities that were pretty active in the late 20s and early 30s, and practically all of them <laughs> felt you know, it, was, it, was a, it was a battle. You had, to, you had to have the better party. So practically all of them booked cruises. Uh, so if they were doing it, imagine some of the other uh, groups that were booking uh, cruises uh, on the on the Wabash during that time period, but you know, when I was talking to Jane about this, when we you know, it, it is so gratifying to know that the history of the Wabash now is we're going back more to the idea of, of, of being you know leisure and you know leisure type of commerce that's going to take off, and you know I really uh, uh, have to hand it to the folks at Riverscape. I know it takes an awful long time to develop these projects. And you have to have many partners in the community and in politics uh, to make that work. But you know, obviously, you all had the foresight in the Riverscape to know that we need to develop the Wabash for its leisure potential and its commercial potential, not just, of course, to preserve it like the Wabashiki. And that's a gem now. And it's going to attract more and more visitors over the years. Um, 
but maybe we could start to get back the jazz pirates to cruise up and, <laughs> uh, and see if we can't uh, can't do that. Uh, uh, but I, I know I'd love to see that kind of uh, that kind of uh, that kind of use of the Wabash now. Um, and thankfully, again, we all uh, go back to the waste. I, I don't want to end on that, but uh, you know. My old ur urban history professor uh, used to talk about, well, you always got your water upstream and you made sure that the streets where most people dumped the refuse flowed and entered the river downstream. So now it becomes somebody else's problem and of course the river would break that up. But I always, there's a reason that, the, that the, the water treatment plant's on the south side of Terre Haute because I'm sure that's where the refuse flowed from all these industrial plants, not just the waste of human waste, but Again, the slaughterhouses, the, uh, the, the different industries there, and I'm sure that's where the water was directed to flow. And of course, unfortunately, the Wabash was a great resource for that. Uh, but we can thank the Clean Water Act, 1972, that starts to clean up the nation's water supply. And uh, again, still growing strong and, and why the Wabash is a much better and cleaner river today than it was uh, certainly uh, a generation or two ago. Well, that's all I have, folks. It was fun uh, talking a little bit about the history uh, of this, but uh, I appreciate your attention. And if anybody has any questions, I can't guarantee I'll answer them uh, competently, but I can give it a shot. Charlie. I didn't want to interrupt, but I was curious to know, do you, was there any information on where that hominy plant was? Uh, yes. Uh, it originally was on Water Street. It was on the river. Um, but he relocated, and I couldn't tell you where he relocated to, an, a much bigger plant, uh, but further away from the river. I, you know, it's, it's, when I was looking at the history of most of the industry, it almost all started on the river um, for various reasons, you know, uh, shipping, waters, water intake, waste removal, things like that. But also, most of them ended up moving when they could, you know, and, and get away from the river and get further inland. Uh, I'd have to look it up, though. Uh, you can look it up pretty, pretty, pretty readily. I, I can get that for you where it moved, but I don't know the exact location. I can't, especially a native like you, I can't uh, compete with your knowledge of local uh, streets on that. Yes. Were the mussels also used as a food source, or were they just simply discarded and thrown away? You know, uh, during the, that harvest, um, so many were harvested. I can't imagine they were used as a food source. I didn't run across any reference to that. I'm sure some people ate them and they were probably marketed locally, but so many were harvested at a single time that again, it would have inundated any kind of uh, market. Um, so if that's, if that's what you're referring to, that, that, that period in the late 19th, early 20th century when they're really harvested, I don't think they were used as a food source. Not a, that was, wasn't a major, you know, it might've been a minor side venture, but not a major one. Um, but yeah, I, I, met, I forgot to mention mussels, uh, you know, I'm sure attracted, you know, it was one of the a food source for, for, you know, centuries. You know, uh, a lot of Native American tr you know, groups would, would use, uh, you know, would regularly stop. One of the main reasons they stopped at the rivers was to get the mussels and the, uh, uh, and I'm sure that attracted a great deal. So I'm sorry I can't answer more definitively on that. It's a good question. And it, it, but uh, I didn't run across any references that that was a big ancillary or auxiliary enterprise in that regard, unfortunately. I think they were all just, uh, 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 probably the majority of it was discarded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you said that building canals ruined the economy in some way? In some parts. Again, the, the economy in Terre Haute was a little bit more healthy because I didn't mention, of course, we had the National Road um, and the river. Uh, so, you know, Terre Haute's economy was okay. What it ruined was the, uh, um, the fiscal rating, I guess, by, to use a modern term, you know, the ability of Indiana to, to raise money uh, in, in any way. And, and, and again, it soured the tax base on any kind of tax ventures. That's what it hurt. I mean, you know, and so again, it, it, then it had this ripple effect where people didn't want to do, you know, raise taxes for education or raise taxes for this. Actually, it was the Whitewater Canal that bankrupted the state of Indiana, the one in the eastern part of the right. state. Yeah. But Terre Haute was the division headquarters for the canal. Mm -hmm. North of Terre Haute, the canal was somewhat of a success. South of Terre Haute, it was a failure. Yeah. It, most people don't realize it left the Wabash. 
Terre Haute was the point at which the canal left. No, 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 she started out across country and went to work in Indiana. They had nothing but trouble with keeping the water level up. They also had nothing but trouble with regulators. I read about that. That's interesting. Yeah. Maybe you might inform everybody what yeah. that was. Well, the people in they built a big reservoir just across the Bible Clay County line, south, straight south of Corey, Indiana. It was a four to five thousand acre lake. And people always look at me when I talk about that. So you must be crazy making up your mind, which was it? Well, lakes don't stay the same level. It rains. What well, the people thought is you were talking about them girding the trees. They didn't have all the massive bulldozers and stuff, so they girded the trees and they let the trees stand in the lake. And people at that point in time in history thought standing water on timber caused malaria. So the people in Clay County banded together and broke the dam. They called themselves the regulators, or, or they were called regulators. Yeah, they called themselves the regulators. The governor, one of the interesting things was the governor of Indiana at the time would not call up a militia from Terre Haute. He said, they're their relatives and neighbors. The militia came up here from Evansville to guard the dam. <laughs> but, but they always had trouble with every any, anywhere they had trouble with keeping the water level up in the canal south of Terre Haute. Uh, is, you know. Yeah, and there was a planned canal from Indianapolis to Terre Haute too. That that never happened. Well, there was a planned canal from Indianapolis to Worthington. It was a part of the Central Canal. It was built in Indianapolis, and Indianapolis, as, as you have said, has made a big deal out of tourism on it. You can go walk. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And that kind of thing, and they made, I don't want to take No, you're fine. I, I mean, yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to talk about the canals, but they uh, made a lot of money on having a walk on the canal and that kind of thing. But it was never finished. It never went on down to Worthington. And actually, if you go read, I know they won't call it Worthington. Worthington wasn't there yet. It was called Point Commerce. Point Commerce is still there, but it's nothing. Mm -hmm. they, they, the the, the Wabash and Erie Canal and the Central Canal were going to meet. In, in Point of Commerce, and it was going to become a great big city. Nobody can tell you where Point of Commerce is today. No. Yeah. Yep. Railroads. Uh, well, the, the, the canal went for the same reason the river went. The canal was going to freeze over in the winter months. The railroads could run in the winter months. And they could run all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and I go, the two first railroad engines that were delivered were delivered on canal boats. The, the canal delivered the boat, the, the engines that were going to put them out. And it's kind of interesting that they hired a man to go get them in the engines in um, Boston. And he uh, got them to, on uh, the Erie Canal, they then transported them to Lake Erie. They got them on the wall, the wall that, well, actually in Ohio, it's the Miami. Erie Canal, and then one of the two engines came to Terre Haute on a canal boat. The other one went down the Miami and Erie Canal to Cincinnati because you could lock out on that one into the Ohio River, and they took it to Madison, Indiana, blocked and tackled it up. If you've ever been to Madison, they can't imagine that. They blocked and tackled it up behind that on Indianapolis on the railroad line. But the canal boats actually delivered the engines that were going to put it out of business. So, uh, the key point. The guy they hired his last name was Petal. Hmm. Yes, um, it is. It was her family, <laughs> Julia Petal. <laughs> well, we should have you have the next talk on that. <laughs> I, 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 I'm on the board of the Canal Society <laughs> of Indiana. I have a vested interest. In yeah, I have to admit I, that's an area that I'm fascinated with, but I have not read much on. So it's uh, uh, you your, your expertise is much much appreciated. If you really want to see Canal. Delphi, Indiana has a really good example. Um, there are rumors that they've done in the canal boat at um, Benamora. It's been beached, and a lot of people think they will not, the state of Indiana will not put that in. But if you want to see a canal boat operate through a lock and everything, you have to go to Grand Rapids, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And they pull their canal boat with mules, and mules mainly pulled canal boats, not horses. Right. I think horses did it, but it was mules. And I one time asked a guy why, and he said, because mules have more sense than to drink water. Because it's stagnant water in there. And he said, they have more sense than to drink the water. Horses don't. I'll remember that. The benefits of mules. Well, all right. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am.
Do you find anything on shanty boats? On shanty boats? Shanty boats living on the... No, uh, you know, this, I was kind of narrowing uh, the talk, you know, a little bit. I couldn't talk about, uh, you know, on that. But what what, uh, what was your curiosity or your interest in that? Uh, Just curious, you know, how far they extend and how <clears throat> No, I mean, you're basically talking about folks that would live on the river and, and, uh, and get, and, and, you know, um, I don't. I didn't run across much information on that. Uh, it is fascinating. I lived for a time down in Baton Rouge, close to Cajun country, and I know a lot of folks south of Baton Rouge lived on the water. And you know, of course, it was an interesting, uh, interesting way of life. And I'm sure it's the same thing in, along the Wabash, kind of a, its own subculture uh, in that regard. It would be fascinating, but I unfortunately don't know much about that. Yes, sir. One question: Did the, the bridges that uh, you were showing they were building the uh, uh, did that have uh, something to do with the demise of the steamboat traffic as well? No, they were both, uh, the, the bridge that was built in 1846 that predated, 1847, that predated the wagon uh, bridge, both of them were called draw bridges. Okay. So they were able to accommodate, like if a keel boat or a steamboat, uh, they were able to get through a channel. My curiosity was there, but it wasn't mentioned, so. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. I should have mentioned that. The original bridge in 1847 was actually called the draw bridge, the Arrow Draw Bridge. Uh, but, you know, I don't know if you, I'm sorry, I already took it off. The wagon bridge, actually, you could, you could see a break because it, it was a covered bridge and you could see an area that was, that was the channel like where, the, the there, where there would be a drawbridge that would go up that would allow for the, so, you know, you, obviously you couldn't accommodate very large steamboats. Uh, so like that palace steamboat that came up, it was actually tugged by a steamboat. It was, a, it didn't have its own engine. Um, you know, uh, it, this was as high as it could have gone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was not going to go any higher on the on the Wabash anyway. But uh, you know, the bridge uh, would have impeded it from going any higher. Although, again, I can't imagine the Wabash being able to support something that large, much beyond this point. But uh, that's a good. That's a good. I'm sorry I didn't mention that because you're right. The bridges. Um, it, it could have been a factor. I remember when I again when I lived in Louisiana, um, they they made a, a deal that you know they 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 could have had river commerce a little further up the the Mississippi than Baton Rouge, but. One of the governors built a bridge that was too low to make sure that they couldn't go any farther than Baton Rouge, uh, and you know it had to stop in Baton Rouge. So you're right; bridges could be uh, a very much an impediment on, on on river commerce traffic. I hadn't thought about that with the with the drawbridge. But that's a good point. Yes, sir. Well, I'm arguing now that uh, ten years to swing the idea of uh, putting a zip line across the <laughs> you know, and it it it, it meant the same fate uh, fate as uh, our waste did is always like down the river, you know. But uh, you know, I, I told you you had to you know a zip line across the river. You have two towers that they leave on the right side of the tower and they come back on the same tower. I don't know. I like a good thrill, but uh, going over a zip line of the the Wabash might be a little too far for me. I don't know. Well, you, you know, and, 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 and that, that's a problem. You know, some people like to ride dirt bikes. Some yeah, people yeah. like riding bicycles. Some people like driving drag, drag race cars or drag boats. And, and others don't. But, you know, I'm just trying to bring some interest to the river. Yeah. No, I, I've i always thought, too, you know, one problem, you know, like with the pleasure craft, like I say, you know, with like the, the party, party uh, excursion boats, you know, certain times a year, you know, the Wabash is a pretty, um, it, it can be a tricky river. You know, uh, the, the currents, the, the debris uh, that can damage things. So, you know, um, that's the other problem with developing the Wabash for leisure is you, you, you've got to be respectful of it and conscious of it, of the, of the dangers that could be there. That's why, again, I think of it, I'm not, I'm not shooting down your idea of zip line, but I'm like, well, if, if, if I, you know, how am I, if I'm going to fall off into the river, I don't want to get caught on a log, you know, it's going to well, take me down to Vincennes. Well, yeah, but every, every, I mean, it's it not like, like, it's like some new phenomenon. They got zip lines, they got it for probably uh, uh, 50 years, and they got it all over the world. Oh, they're, they're a big deal, I mean, for, you, for you tourism. Could river, you could, you know, Air Bach would have a life vest on. You'd have somebody down the river with, with, uh, with like a net. Uh, get, you get a big net, you know. Well, that you could be there. You would have one big seat Yeah. I'm sure that, that other people got down the zip lines, uh, they have some way to stop them. You know, they just yeah. slam them to them. Well, you keep talking it up, and we'll see what happens yeah. on this regard. But, yeah. you know, but, you know, I mean, I, you know it, 
I, I think any kind of developing, you know, uh, that kind of uh, leisure activity on the Wabash, you know, um, it does, it's, got, it's got some merit, you know. It's so. it demanding something to do when you go in <laughs> right. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. With the new casino, you can bet on who was going to make it. Yeah. yeah. That's not a bad idea. You can bet on anything in the casinos, right? So uh, that's that's not a, that's, see, you're thinking. Yeah. Thank Brain, you Thanks very much.